All right, everyone, it's the hour, so we'll get started. Uh, I'll remind you again that our uh, Future Technologies Working Group has this webinar every month uh, at this time slot uh, on the first Thursday, and we have slots available. So if you or someone you know uh, has something you'd love to see presented here, have them email me and we'll get them into the program. Uh, today we have uh, Mark Fishman from JPL, who will be talking about Europa Clipper's recent sounding radar. Uh, in terms of the flight electronics implementation and its ground testing. Uh, so Mark, please go ahead. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A uh, chat and we'll read them out uh, at the end. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Great, yes, um, thank you. Um, it's really nice to be here with Instrumentation Future Technologies. So let's see, let me... Let's see if I can control the screen. So I'm not sure if I can, okay, there we go. Um, so first I uh, just wanted to give a definition. Uh, Reason is uh, an acronym uh, for the instrument, the, the radar instrument that we're flying on Europa Clipper. It stands for Radar for Europa Assessment and Sounding Ocean to Near Surface. And this um, is work that's culminated, uh, this goes back 20 years or so from a, a proposed instrument uh, to go to Europa uh, for radar sounding. Um, the, uh, the, the people leading this were uh, Don Blankenship, who's our principal investigator. He's at uh, UTIG, University of Texas, Austin and Alina Misesian, the instrument manager. Um, so Reason, it's a uh, dual frequency uh, sounding radar. It's got an uh, HF band at nine megahertz and a VHF band at 60 megahertz. And these uh, frequency bands work to complement each other for the, the primary uh, mission objective of sounding at and below uh, the uh, icy surface of Europa. Um, there's several science applications, but one of the key applications is, is uh, probing below the surface, getting the vertical profile, uh, taking advantage at these low frequencies of the dielectric contrast between ice and water to uh, uh, identify where that boundary might be, try to figure out what's the thickness of the ice layer, layer and uh, infer uh, what might be a, a vast liquid ocean below the surface. So, okay, so the, the, the main things I'm gonna be talking about today uh, the first is I'll give you an overview of uh, the Europa Clipper spacecraft and how Reason fits into it. Um, I'll give you a high-level description of the radar instrument uh, design. And then I was going to get into the nuts and bolts of the uh, electronics and give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look at uh, what, what we developed for the reason uh, radar electronics, how we did the ground testing. And since most recently I was on the instrument engineering side of things, uh, how we did the functional verification uh, on the ground. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the flight model test campaign to date uh, especially the environmental testing that we've done at the instrument level and also the um, ambient testing that's been done so far at the um, system level of integration with, with all of Europe at Clipper. Okay, I don't, I guess there's a delay in me flipping the slides. Can are you guys able to go to the next? Okay, great. And next one. 
All right, so uh, overview of the Europa Clipper flight system. This is a, a computer uh, based drawing of uh, the entire spacecraft and it's a, it's a humongous uh, spacecraft. Once the solar arrays are deployed, it's like the length of a NBA basketball court. So, so very large. Um, you need the big solar arrays because we're we're far out at Jupiter. Um, there's uh, there's nine instruments on the science uh, payload side, nine science instruments, and the uh, the spacecraft is made up of three main components. There's the avionics module that houses most of the uh, electronics for the the avionics and the science instruments and uh, those those subsystems are contained in this thing that we call the vault, which is basically it's basically a thick aluminum box, about four hundred mils thick aluminum, to protect the electronics from the extreme radiation environment. Um, there's also the RF module, so that includes the high gain antenna and the telecom system for uh, receiving commands from Earth and telemetering the science data back to Earth. And then there's the propulsion module or prop module, um, which is, it's the, the structure um, uh, kind of to the, to the right or, or below the avionics shown here uh, that uh, includes, uh, includes a, uh, rotary joint or two rotary joints that are going to the solar arrays um, and, and the solar arrays themselves. So the, the prop module includes the solar arrays. The, uh, the reason radar, the active radar electronics are all within the radiation vault, um, but our antennas are out flapping in the wind in the, the radiation environment. And those are these, you can kind of see these uh, these sticks here on the the top side of the solar array, as it's shown, and those are the uh, the dipole antennas that make up uh, antenna arrays for the HF and the VHF. Um, and so, right now in uh, in System INT, the entire Europa Clipper spacecraft is put together minus the solar arrays, which includes the reason antennas. So the the solar arrays and the recent antennas will meet up with the flight fault electronics for the first time um, in spring of 2024 when we ship uh, everything out to Kennedy Space Center. And next, okay. So as far as the mission, op, uh, the mission ops concept here, uh, Europa Clipper is in a highly eccentric orbit, orbit around Jupiter. Uh, the period is about once every two weeks. So uh, once every two weeks, we approach Europa, uh, power, on, uh, power on the science instruments, uh, start collection, closest approach, which is close. It can be as close as 25 kilometers uh, altitude, so we're kind of skimming the surface, and then uh, departure, uh, clean up, uh, power down, and then uh, a couple of days later, turn the spacecraft around, point the high gain antenna toward Earth, and send the send the uh, science data back down. Um, the The motivation for doing things this way, instead of being in orbit around Europa, is uh, Jupiter has this really horrendous radiation environment um, and we're trying to spend as little time in that high radiation zone as possible. So we're essentially uh, swiping our hand quickly over the hot coals and uh, trying to avoid turning all the electronics in, into toast. So that's that's the, the, the motivating force for the flyby. Okay, next.
Okay, and to orient you, the, uh, the coordinate convention system that we use, the plus C direction is the direction of motion of the spacecraft. Uh, the plus Y is uh, the, the down looking uh, direction. So that's uh, the antennas are basically uh, viewing a scene in the plus Y direction. And you can see the antennas are on the bottom edge of the solar array in this illustration. And then, and then the, the, the minus X and the plus X direction you can think of as like the port and the starboard sides of the spacecraft. Um, so we've got, you know, a minus X solar array wing with half of the dipole uh, antennas in the array on that side. And then uh, the plus X wing uh, starboard with the, the uh, solar array and the antenna elements on that side. All right, next. Okay, so um, let's see. You know what, you could try clicking, try clicking the link uh, at the bottom here. Or if I'm sharing the screen, I could try. No, actually, I think you're sharing. Are you able to click that uh, URL link at the bottom? Yeah, try running that video. So this is this is an animation of the flyby. So it's uh, from the point of view of uh, the Clipper spacecraft. So I guess we're bandwidth limited. <laughs> okay, so this is the approach when we're within 1000 uh, or before before that point we power on the radar instrument along with all the other uh, the other eight science instruments when we're uh, a, a thousand kilometers out we uh, start our main science data collection and uh, executing our, our sequence for that collection and then we approach Europa, and like I said, the the closest approach it can vary anywhere between anywhere from twenty five to to hundred kilometers altitude, and then start the departure. We do our science data cleanup, and then uh, power down the radar. And depart. And uh, yeah, that whole process, I mean, it's, it's faster in the video that the whole process takes about 40 minutes from the time that reason uh the reason radar first powers on to the time that it powers down so um it it does happen relatively quickly although not that quickly okay so let's see are we able to get to the next slide All right, so a little bit of a, a system level description of the radar and its design. Okay, um, some of the some of the main specifications, um, uh, like like we were talking about, this is a dual frequency uh, radar system, nine megahertz in 
60 megahertz. It, it is a, a linear FM chirp uh, system. So we're transmitting a chirp and then um, uh, we do some block floating point quantization compression on the range lines. And, and when the data comes down to the ground, uh, do the pulse compression processing and so on. Um, uh, the HF is uh, lower bandwidth. It's a one megahertz uh, uh, chirp signal bandwidth. The VHF is higher at 10 megahertz. So this is where the two frequency bands uh, complement each other. Uh, with HF, we get uh, sounding at, at uh, greater depth below the surface, but at lower spatial resolution. And VHF, we uh, have more shallow sounding, but higher uh, vertical spatial resolution. Um, and yes, this is an array system. Two elements on HF, four elements on VHF. Our, in terms of our transmit power, our peak transmit power is about 32 watts uh, per array. If you if you add up the individual uh, RF peak powers from from each uh, antenna element, um, the other thing to note is that there you can see there are some specs on VHF interferometry at the bottom. We are uh, collecting uh, in independent receiver hardware on board. We're uh, collecting. Uh, the combined echoes from the minus X side of the VHF band and the plus X side so that we, we can do cross-track interferometry. And the motivation for that is that uh, when, you're, when you're sounding, if you have a desired uh, target a certain depth below the surface, that can actually coincide with if you have strong surface clutter uh, out to the side. And uh, when we want to be able to discriminate the, the clutter from the signal. So with uh, interferometry, we can look at those phase differences in post-processing and, and be able to make that distinction and filter out the uh, undesired clutter. Um, in terms of resources, our data rate, we have a peak data rate of 110 megabits per second coming out of the spacewire interface from the radar back to the spacecraft. And we've stress tested that. Um, in terms of mass and power, the total mass of the reason electronics inside the vault and the antennas, it's about 65, 70 kilograms. That's not including uh, some of the, the coax cable runs, but we're, we're roughly in that, that ballpark. And uh, as far as power consumption, um, it depends on the transmit duty cycle you're, we're using during the flyby, but the peak power consumption is in the 60 to 65 watt regime. So not, not super high transmit power for a radar, although we are trying to conserve energy in Europa Clipper. Okay, next. Okay, so a functional view. Um, uh, so, you know, the the reason radar it is being a low frequency radar architecturally, it's really uh, uh, fairly straightforward as as radars go, um, because we are at operating at relatively low HF and VHF frequencies. We don't need to do any up conversion or down conversion in the RF electronics, um, the generation of the chirp signals and the, uh, the down conversion and encoding of the echoes, that's, that's entirely done in the digital electronics. Uh, the, other, the other thing to note that is, is um, uh, simplifying in the architecture is we don't have, the, the radar is not really it doesn't really have smarts. There's no uh, flight software or flight computer on board. Uh, the main control and timing and processing is all embedded in a single Vertex 5 
uh, flight grade FPGA and uh, the reception and, and decoding of commands that's all state machine based. Um, and we have this uh, radar parameter lookup table that we load from the spacecraft and then we basically play out that lookup table. We, we call that an observation plan or OP for short. Um, and the, the radar is actually, it's not intelligent or making decisions about what to, to do. Everything in the observation plan, as far as what the radar sh parameter should be at what time in the sequence, that's, that's all uh, uh, determined a priori because we know the trajectory. And then uh, uh, the, the digital electronics is basically playing out that observation plan in a deterministic way once we get to a very particular point in the trajectory. Um, so, so that's a little bit on the digital side. On the RF side, the, uh, the transmitters, they're uh, GAN, GAN based transmitter class D amplifiers, uh, pretty high efficiency. We uh, send the transmit pulses out. They get distributed along uh, coax feed lines that go to the to the six antennas in the array. There's a matching network at the antenna that impedance matches the 50 ohm characteristic impedance of the feed lines to the uh, the impedance of the the dipoles, the dipole antennas, um, and we also uh, in the, the T transmit receive circuitry, we have uh, calibration loopback signals that are taking a portion of the transmitted power, looping it back into the receiver uh, for all three receivers, HF, VHF minus X, VHF plus X. Uh, and we, use, we can use that information to gauge changes in amplitude and phase of the transmit receive uh, path over the course of the flyby if we need to make any calibration corrections. Um, okay, and let's go to the next. And then that was a functional view of the radar. Now looking at a kind of a hardware configuration view, there's there's two main sections of the radar. There's the, the in-vault part and the out-of-vault part. Inside the vault, we've got three stacks, three electronic stacks, one for the HF transmit and receive, that's the HF stack, and then the VHF stack for the VHF transmit and receive. And uh, in the middle there, we've got uh, uh, the digital and frequency synthesizer electronics. And um, one thing I should mention is that the digital electronics, it is block redundant. We designed it that way so that if we have a fault in one of the in the digital electronics we call Daisy, if we have a fault in one of the Daisies, we don't bring down the entire radar. We can switch over to the other one. Um, outside the vault, we've got the six antenna assemblies: two for HF, four for VHF. So that includes the the dipoles and also the deployment mechanisms. And between the two, we have the coax feed lines that run uh, from inside to outside of the vault through, uh, through feed through connectors. And I'm just to give you my background, background, the last seven years work I've been doing on Reason, first five years was instrument integration test manager for the involved electronics. And then last two years, I've been serving as the instrument engineer for the involved electronics. So the rest of this talk is gonna be pretty involved centric just because that's what I've been, <laughs> I've been doing, but there's definitely the antennas and all the work that goes into them, which is a whole nother story. Okay, next. All right, so I, I mentioned this observation plan lookup table sequence uh, that we, that uh, this is part of our operational concept. Um, so during the flyby, 
as you as you might imagine, um, the the radar uh, parameters for uh, timing and how much signal to noise we need, how much how long we need our transmit pulse to be, what what a receiver gain needs to be. This is all changing very rapidly and dynamically. Um, so this makes you know a flyby instrument like Reason very different from an orbiter like I think Marsis and Sharad would fall into that category where, where the orbiters have a fairly constant uh, pulse repetition frequency and and overall gain of the you know uh, radar equation gain of the system. This is a totally different ball game. Um, so uh, we needed to come up with a way to for each flyby to take the radar measurements in a way that's optimizing uh, uh, sampling and range, sampling and Doppler, signal to noise. Um, and so we came up with this scheme where the radar is essentially dumb and just playing out this uh, uh, OBS plan lookup table sequence in a, in a predetermined way. Um, getting into the details of that that architecture for the OP, uh, we used a nested timing scheme that's controlled by the uh, FPGA firmware. And so basically going from, from the top of the nest down, we have our observation plans and the, the main uh, science collection over the observation plan is about 16 minutes long. Um, Go one level deeper, we have what we call dwells. Those get updated roughly once per second or once every couple seconds on that order. And each new dwell, uh, the radar electronics grab the next index in the sequence for, for setting things like transmit pulse width, um, receive window width and position, receiver gain, um, what data, what science uh, types of science packets we're actually collecting. So that happens every dwell. Inside a dwell, we have a thing called a cycle, which is a re repeating sequence of events. And you can think of a cycle as being like a pulse repetition interval, but it's not necessarily uh, always synonymous with, with PRI. It depends on the details of, of what we're doing. And then the events are basically transmit or receive events at a given uh, frequency band and for a given receive gate duration and position. So typical uh, a typical OBS plan sequence would be kind of the conventional uh, sequential transmit. We transmit HF, transmit VHF, and then we receive HF and VHF, and those, those uh, echoes can coincide. But we, we have the flexibility of doing more complex uh, OP settings. Um, there's quite a bit of flexibility in this architecture. So uh, for example, you could have multiple VHF events nested within an HF event because the VHF has, typically it has more shallow sounding, so the receive gate is is shorter. Okay, um, next. Okay, now we get into kind of the behind the scenes on the flight hardware. But before flight hardware, um, so we we developed an engineering model of the involved electronics first. This really started coming together in like around mid 2019. Um, and it is, uh, it is a close replica of the flight model in terms of form, fit and function. It's not exactly the same as the FM. It has some differences. One of the key differences is the digital electronics single string, not redundant for the EM, um, but, but it has most most of the, the functionality of the, the flight electronics. And um, the, the EM, we started, like I said, in 2019, getting the subsystems together. 
um, it became an incredibly valuable tool for us for cutting our teeth on testing uh, the reason radar and developing our test procedures, um, identifying uh, issues and, and resolving those. Um, I would say also for the, for instrument int, uh, it was it was very important to have the EM, uh, especially once we set up our EGSE so that we were staging it in a way that matched the way we were going to do our flight environmental testing, including all of the cabling uh, that would go into the TVAC chamber. We identified a number of problems in the EGSE early on that we were able to then fix so that uh, flight testing could go more smoothly. Um, at the same time, the Europa Clipper test bed, which, which has its own, you can think of as engineering model of the entire flight spacecraft, they, they needed and they wanted the EM uh, starting back in 2019 so that they could start doing early interface testing with the, the EM version avionics. Uh, so we were in a conundrum because this was an important asset for us, uh, but it was needed by uh, Europa Clipper system test bed. So as a compromise, we built a, another piece of equipment that we call the Reason test model. It doesn't have quite the form uh, or fit of the FM, but Functionally, it is a pretty high fidelity emulator of the electrical interfaces going back uh, to the, the spacecraft. So we, we built the test model, delivered that in early 2020. It went to the system test bed, got integrated into their system, and they've been using it ever since. One of the, one of the key functions uh, of the test model is to do trial runs of observation plans that we create before they go to system INT with the, the full flight system. Okay, next. All right, and then um, and then this is the start of the show, the, the flight hardware that's actually going to Jupiter. The, Photo on the left shows the three stacks, um, flight stacks with all of the, the harnessing that's for um, the HF stack, the DAISY and the VHF stack. And this left photo was taken before we delivered to Europa Clipper. Um, so this hardware is mounted on uh, mechanical ground support equipment that it's kind of a surrogate plate for the, uh, what for the avionics uh, vault before uh, before delivery. So the, the, the mechan mechanical plate and the thing below it, those are not actually going into space. Um, then in March of this year, we delivered the uh, in-vault electronics and then the um, uh, Atla, the assembly test and launch operations folks, they installed the vault electronics onto the uh, onto one of the panels of the radiation vault. And you can just kind of barely see it here. This thing that is like, they call it the barn door, the barn door that is open on the inside. You can see some stuff here. That's the the recent electronics that just got installed by Atla and, the, and they were in the process of doing it electrical interface uh, testing. All right, next. Um, and for instrument INT, for testing the, uh, at the, the radar electronics level, there was a suite of electronic ground support equipment that we developed. We developed this in uh, cooperation with NASA Goddard, they did quite a bit of the design and build uh, and helped us with that. There's uh, there's several components to talk about here. There's the spacecraft simulator, which is emulating uh, bus power to the, the Reason Radar Electronics. The, it's uh, providing the spacewire 
interface and it's pro providing some discrete controls that control how we uh, boot up and configure the, the flight FPGA. Um, in the middle here, there's an RF test rack uh, because instrument INT was testing without the antennas yet. Uh, this served as kind of a stand-in for the antennas and it interfaced to the six antenna ports uh, coming off the HF and VHF stacks. Um, it also includes a fairly elaborate switch matrix that interfaces the six uh, antenna ports to uh, an entire suite of uh, commercial test and measurement equipment and some custom equipment too. One of those custom pieces of equipment is the fiber optic delay line. That's the thing on the right here. And that's, it's uh, literally a spool of 30 some kilometers of fiber optic line that's in a precisely temperature controlled box. And it's got photonics devices to convert RF to optical and then back. And so uh, given the length of the line, it gives us about a 160 microsecond delay that can emulate for us a round trip uh, delay for, for a point target. So the, uh, you know, we can do, you can think of as end-to-end -end testing of the radar where we're testing both the transmitter and then delay the echo through the photo, it comes back into the receiver and we can process it. Um, so yeah, I have listed out here, there's, there's several different types of signal generator sources that we have in the system. And uh, from this, there's, there's a number of type of echo scenarios that we were able to, to uh, use for comprehensively verifying the radar. So point target with the photo, distributed target with the arbitrary waveform generators, and then we could do, uh, you know, pulsed and uh, CW waveforms and so on. All oh, right, next. Um, there's there's many features that are built into the radar that uh, that also allow us to do built-in testing, both on the ground and eventually during the mission. Um, like most instruments, we have housekeeping telemetry coming back. We call it um, health and status telemetry. Uh, so so there's, there's a large number of fields coming back that tell us things about how the radar is uh, operating, what's the operating, current operating state of the observation plan. And there's also a bunch of um, analog telemetry, temperature, voltages, currents throughout the system that give us kind of, a, kind of an overall picture of the health of the, the radar hardware. Um, and then there are built-in test modes, like um, I mentioned the, the loopback calibration that gives us um, a way to characterize the, the transit power times receiver gain function of the radar. Um, as a type of diagnostic, we can uh, collect um, to, to within the, the bandwidth limitations of the space wire, uh, we can collect raw science ADC data. So this is helpful if we see something funny in the receive echoes and we want to look at the, the raw um, undecimated data in the time domain and the frequency domain before the data compression happens in the onboard processing. Um, and we also have uh, internal loads in the, the receiver front end, so we can switch to internal load and measure the system noise floor against other targets like, uh, like uh, looking at the galactic noise, and that, that allows us to do kind of calibration of the radar receiver. Okay, next. Um, there were... There were a large number of tests that we ran in our test campaign. Uh, ambient campaign was in 2022, and then 
environmental at near the end of that year. Um, but there's there's also a subset of uh, tests in that group that fall in the category of what we would call a radar standard test. And um, that, that means that we're running the test at the instrument level the same way every time. We're using the same OP parameters. We're using the same um, settings for the, the uh, EGSE test and measurement equipment. Um, and this becomes really important for uh, monitoring the health of the hardware and um, looking at the trends over time uh, to be doing the same type of tests, you know, interject these repeated uh, standard tests. So I listed out the, the main ones that fall into this category. Um, and one of the ones I'll talk about in a little more detail is one that we call Superfly. And this is, it's a, uh, it's a flight-like, uh, uh, it's a demonstration of the flight-like flyby sequence uh, so that we're going through the same type of pow uh, power commanding and observation execution sequence that we would actually do in flight. Um, but it's tailored in a couple of ways. It's tailored first to operate with the, the photo so that we can see the delayed echoes coming back and we can be verifying uh, that, that part of the radar. Um, the other thing is we set up the observation plan for a uh, constant transmit pulse width, but then we're, we're kind of faking a flyby where we're starting at a thousand kilometers altitude and going down where the, the photo, uh, the, fo the photo is actually a shorter delay. It's 160 microseconds. It's not the, the millisecond regime that you would have at the start of the flyby. So what we do is uh, we uh, start off with uh, a PRI that's emulating a number of echoes in flight. And then we're reducing the PRI as, as the altitude decreases. At the same time, we're sliding in the receive window uh, uh, along with the PRI. We keep on doing that until we hit, hit our maximum duty type cycle constraint for, for transmit, then we decrement echoes in flight and start the process over again. We go all the way to closest approach and then we reverse the process. Um, by doing that, uh, we're changing the, the duty cycle versus time in this very, it gives you this very distinctive um, signature, this, this kind of accordion pattern, which uh, that gets reflected in the uh, bus power consumption versus time, which is easy to see in real time when we're actually running a test. So it gives us kind of this nice canonical pattern in the, the bus current versus time. Um, that's, that's a verification that everything is going okay during this, this demonstration of a flyby. Okay, next. Um, the other thing I would mention is uh, we just because of the sheer number of tests that we were doing, and we were we were running double shifts for a large portion of 2022. Um, it became really important on the instrument engineering side to try to standardize how we assess the health of the radar, and um, a couple of things that really helped and really paid off in the end. One is um, we came up with a kind of a standard rubric for how do you evaluate the health of the radar? And we, we broke that assessment down into several categories. So it became a, a, an APGAR score of sorts for, for the radar. Um, the other thing that was fortunate is we had, we had clever people on the instrument engineering team who very quickly put together uh, automated code for generating all kinds of plots with the real-time telemetry 
and um, that would do all, all kinds of automated checks to make sure that all of the um, H and S telemetry was in nominal range and doing uh, timing rules checks uh, to make sure we're not violating any of the, the transmit safety timing rules for the radar hardware. So this kind of, kind of standardizing and organizing how we look at the data really helped tremendously later on. Okay, next. And okay, so I'll give you just a little bit of a, a sense of the, the uh, environmental testing that we did uh, before delivery to Europe at Clipper and then some of the testing that Clipper did. So uh, our TVAC test campaign, it was, it was a fairly long and grueling campaign. It was about a month long. Um, one of the longest I've, I've worked on. Um, a couple of things that were driving that duration. Um, first, because we had a redundant digital electronic system, we have uh, mission assurance has you know a minimum uh, requirement on operating hours at at hot and cold plateaus. So having a, a block redundant system, we essentially had to double our um, testing time because of the daisy. The other thing to note is um, as as I was mentioning before, the observation plans. There's a lot of flexibility in how we can develop this. And there's a lot of ways we can exercise the transmitter and the transmit duty cycle can vary rapidly over time, depending on how we uh, design the OP. So we wanted to make sure that our uh, uh, RF power supplies for the transmitter were staying sufficiently uh, enough within regulation that we would get a good science product out of it. And we had to test that over different temperature plateaus, different bus voltages, and also different OBS plans where we're exercising a variety of transmit duty cycles and changes um, in that with respect to time. Um, so that that um, that lengthen, those things lengthen test. The good news is, um, Although we had a few glitches here and there with the facilities and our local network, we didn't actually uncover any problems with the flight hardware. It took it. Um, so everything uh, got a passing score for vital signs there. So we were tired but happy. Okay. And after TVEC, we went to electromagnetic compatibility testing um, again, antennas are not in the system yet, so we're transmitting into loads. We're not intentionally radiating into free space. Um, a couple of uh, quick highlights or things that we, we remember vividly from this test, um, that middle graph is our uh, radiated emissions test. That's where they put some standard uh, standard antennas a meter away from the fall electronics. And then we run the radar in what we call the noisy radar mode where we're transmitting and we're jumping around in PRI. Uh, and um, that, blue, that blue line is the what the EMC team recorded. The red line is our not to exceed limit. And we, we passed with flying colors for like 20 to 30 dB below the limit. Uh, John Trin, who was running EMC, he couldn't believe it. He thought, surely you guys don't have the radar on. So we had to prove to him that we did uh, walking over to the EGSC. So, so this is, um, uh, I think it really says a lot about how well the hardware designers packaged everything and especially the the assemblies and the cable shielding. Um, this this was a good result. The other interesting thing on the right, this is when we did a normal transients fault, and that's where the radar is operating. It's humming along, and suddenly we whack the bus voltage with a, a low going pulse for about a couple hundred milliseconds. Uh, let it go, 
below the minimum allowed bus voltage and we see what happens. And um, we saw a little momentary flicker in the, the transmit uh, pulse sequence and the operators saw um, telemetry turn red momentarily, but then everything recovered. So that was, that was kind of an exciting test to see that the radar could take it on the chin. Okay. And um, so, yeah, then we delivered to Europa Clipper and this year they've been working um, very diligently, uh, did the installation and electrical integration to the spacecraft. We've gone through a suite of functional tests on both, uh, both daisy strings. And then in late August, um, Clipper ran this elaborate test that they call system test one, which it's a, it's a week long test 24 seven, where they, they basically do a dress rehearsal for the entire mission. And they, they basically, uh, uh, command the spacecraft and look at the response, uh, simulating all the phases of the mission, including launch cruise. Jupiter orbit insertion and a, a, a tour flyby of Europa. Um, so the flyby, the ST-1 flyby, all nine science instruments were participating and Reason was one of them. And um, this graph on the bottom here is a plot of the HF stack, less power versus time. And you can see that signature that I was talking about um, for Superfly. and um, this, this single plot is revealing a, a lot of information that, that, you know, we did our power on sequence correctly. We went into standby. We, we started our, our warm up, and then um, we executed the observation plan uh, basically the way we expected, um, which means that we also, the, the load sequence from the spacecraft um, and the, the, trigger time, trigger timing of when we start the OBS plan that, that also executed correctly. Um, the, the graphs on the right are different visualizations of the receive echoes coming back through the photo, back into the radar, and then coming out as process data. And you can see this line, it's kind of appearing and then it's going in and out, in and out. Uh, that's basically the, and a similar thing here, but this is a waterfall plot, range lines and fast time on the horizontal axis and slow time on the vertical. Um, this is, uh, this, this appearance and disappearance of the echoes is due to that sliding receive window I was talking about. It's basically, we're seeing the receive gate slide over the, the, the fixed point target response coming back from the photo and we're, we're seeing it go to maximum when the, the gate is fully enveloping the, um, the echo. So um, it's, a, it's a nice, another nice tool in a way to see the transmitter is working, the receiver is working, the control and timing is working and you kind of get that all in one test, which is nice. Mark, just letting you know we're at 8.53. All right, perfect. Thank you. Um, so I think the last slide, um, I think that's it. And um, I wanted to really acknowledge um, the people on the Reason Hardware team and beyond. Um, it, uh, it was a simple radar and not a simple radar. Um, it actually is not, not simple uh, to pull off. We needed a lot of um, smart people and um, they were very, hardworking, good to work with. So I just wanted to um, give a, a shout out here to um, all, of, all of the wonderful people on Reason who did this work. Wonderful, well, thanks for a great presentation. We have about six minutes for questions now. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the webinar chat or the Q and A. Um, we've got one here I'll start with from Joel Johnson, which says, could you say more about the antenna patterns and how those relate to the spatial resolution 
obtained and or if any of the other processing is used to improve spatial resolution. You know what? Um, I could try to answer, but since most of my work was on the involved electronics, Elaine, do you do you want to take a it, sure. and you might have to come to my laptop because it's using these speakers. Okay. I'll, I'll... No. <laughs> no. Um that's uh that's probably a whole nother talk in its <laughs> in itself. I mean, I know we're doing um uh uh you know there's there's sampling in the Doppler spectrum and there's pre-summing that can be done to uh, increase spatial resolution in the along track direction. Um, but the people who the people who uh, have most recently been working on this, I, I think Elaine is leading the charge, but it's people like Ilgen Seeker and um, maybe Ruz, Ruzba Akbar and uh, Young Gim and the company. Am I missing Mark Haynes? Those people are the ones who would be the experts. I was more on the hardware side. Great. Another uh, sort of technical question here, which is how many bands and what is the resolution? And I guess in this case, it probably means range resolution. So the range resolution vertically, it is, it's, I think, uh, Elaine, correct me if this is wrong, but I think it's a, about 150 meters for HF, about 15 meters for VHF. Yeah, based on the signal bandwidth. Um, we also have a couple uh, larger questions about Europa as a target, uh, asking about whether rivers on Europa are like Earth, whether there are clouds on Europa, uh, and commenting on the habitability of Europa. I suspect that's maybe slightly further even than the beam pattern from what your presentation was about. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you said rivers. Uh, uh, that is rivers. what the question said. Um, I okay. What I know, I'm not. I'm not a, a planetary scientist. I'm an electrical engineer. Um, uh, I don't know about rivers. I know there. There's like, there might be spiky structures in, on on the top ice layer. I think there are plumes that are ejecting some type of vapor or gas and i think it's actually one of the science instruments on europa is doing in situ measurements of that is that correct yeah, so he, so oh you you can you can answer the question <laughs> yes 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 that's right yeah there are plumes and uh, some of the instruments will fly right through them hoping to find yeah. signatures of life um yeah i guess also in uh to joel's question i mean i think uh, it is often the case for sounders, and I think it'll be the case for us as well, uh, that the beam pattern doesn't tend to be terribly limiting, and it's often the targets, if they're specular, that govern what you end up seeing, um, and that there will be a long track star focusing for reason as well, so that will affect the long track resolution. Any other right. questions with our remaining two minutes? I mean, I guess one, one question I would say is, you know, when you look at this and you had this incredibly good performance in terms of EMI, like if you if you were speaking to other groups who sought to have similarly excellent instruments, uh, how, how would, like, what are, what are the key takeaways to try and, you know, get it to go so well in the end? Right. So, I mean, for, for, um, electromagnetic compatibility there's you're trying to control the sources first of all and then you're also trying to um, attenuate between the source and the victim um, there are various ways to control uh, sources we're, we're especially worried at these low frequencies about interference from the digital electronics they tend to the the rising and falling edges of those sharp waveforms tend to generate uh, combs of uh, spikes in the frequency domain. So a, a lot of it is um, looking at the signal integrity of the digital electronics and making sure that we're, um, you know, at the PCB board level, we're terminating things correctly. We're controlling rise and fall times where we can. And then as far as the attenuation part goes, 
you try to do really good shielding of the electronics boxes. There are EMI gaskets you can use. There are um, ga EMI gaskets for the connectors. And you try to do really good um, uh, treatment or design and treatment of the cable harness because those are notorious for radiating. Um, you try to make sure you avoid single single ended interfaces. You try to use balanced um, uh, differential interfaces and you shield the heck out of the cables. You usually have at least two uh, uh, layers of shielding treatment and you have to make sure you terminate that shielding at the cable ends really well. Um, so if you do all of those things, then you can get a quiet instrument, but it takes, it takes uh, thought. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much. We're at the hour and we want to respect everyone's time. So if you have additional questions, please feel free to email Mark. And again, if you think of other people you'd like to see in this webinar, uh, please let me know and we'll get them on the docket. Thank Thanks you. Again.